be the handout for today and for Wednesday. So uh, the plan is to have today and Wednesday be the two Jephthah classes. Uh, I'm not sure how much we'll get through. Jephthah actually, in terms of text, is not as long as perhaps the Gideon narrative or the Samson narrative. So it could be that we end up with some extra time, and that'll be great. On Wednesday, we'll use that to uh, uh, go over themes, uh, review some, tie things together. Uh, and uh, also, I don't know how many of us will be here on Wednesday, but we will have class Wednesday, and the handout you're holding will be the, the handout, whether you're here Wednesday or watching online as you're traveling or, or whatever else. Um, so, speaking of extra time, we didn't quite finish Gideon, on, uh, Gideon and Abimelech on uh, Wednesday, and mainly we did get through the whole story. We, we talked about the, the Abimelech story in chapter uh, uh, 9, and uh, we did not get to chapter 10 and the, the couple judges that come after Abimelech, but we did finish Gideon and Abimelech. So there's a few things that I wanted to say by way of kind of wrapping up. Okay, so if we remember Gideon's rise to being a judge, the reluctant warrior that's helped along by God, and he, 300 men, defeats the Midianites, and then uh, there's kind of phase two of that story where he becomes a little bit more maybe rogue, violent, uh, and he slaughters the two Midianite kings and also uh, comes back and uh, kills, as by way of punishment, some of the Israelites that did not help him in the pursuit of the Midianite kings. And then we talked about Gideon's retirement. I'm not going to be a king, but uh, the way he acts maybe, you know, uh, sends a different message in terms of his wives and his wealth and the idol that was set up in Ophrah. And then Abimelech whose name means my father is king, he usurps his brothers and uh, he has his brief reign of terror, at least there in uh, his, his region um, of Israel. And so what do we make of all of this? How do we see this in the context of the judge's story? And so I'm, I want to say, point out four things, and these all kind of fit in the same category of we see how things are progressing here. We see the direction of the book of Judges, the trajectory of the book of Judges. Remember that at the beginning of the Gideon story, God's response is harsher and more direct than we'd seen. Okay? So remember, we, we, had, uh, we had a prophet, we had angels that would speak to the people in times past. Deborah herself was a prophetess. But remember, the, at the beginning of the Gideon story, the, the prophet said uh, to the people, you know, you, keep, you, you still disobey me. And that was basically the end. There, there was no, okay, and now I'm going to deliver you. He does end up delivering them. But he's a little bit more harsh to say, look, I've done all this stuff for you, and what have you done for me? And so God's response maybe would teach us something about the, uh, the progression here of events. Also notice that uh, one of the themes that we'll see throughout Judges, that we are seeing, tribal conflict. Um, this time, that tribal conflict, the, the, the kind of hostility or the beef, as we said, between different tribes in Israel, this time there's bloodshed. Israelites killing Israelites as a result of the conflict. Um, we had seen conflict before, but uh, in, in the case of Deborah and Barak, when the tribes don't show up for battle, you know, they write a diss track, you know, and they mention them in the song and say, hey, these tribes, you know, didn't come to our aid. But, you know, there was no physical conflict. Here with Gideon, he uh, takes him to the woodshed and, and destroys a tower and kills some people that didn't come to help. Uh, so that's a change in the judge's story. Also, we noted that the falling away, the apostasy of Gideon, uh, of Gideon's time after Gideon, seems to happen earlier. Remember that Gideon himself seems to be responsible, setting up of the ephod, the way that he conducted himself, instead of, Everything was fine and dandy in Gideon's time, and then after Gideon, things fell apart. There is some of that in the way that the text describes what happens. It says after Gideon died, the people started serving idols and all that. But we, we see evidence of this happening sooner, maybe, than it happened in previous generations. And then the last thing we'll introduce, and this will kind of keep this in mind as we go, for the first time in the book of Judges, the idea of a king shows up. We had not seen that in any place in Judges up, up to this point. When they ask Gideon to be king, Gideon says, no, I won't be a king. Perhaps he acts like a king, and then Abimelech, his son, does try to make himself king. Um, and it doesn't go well. We should notice that. Um, and so, going forward, remember that will be a theme, our memory verse, our one memory verse for the whole class. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The idea of kingship is important. But remember from the Gideon story that it's not... 
it's not simply the fact that God doesn't want a king at all, and so any kind of king is bad. Remember, Gideon's response is not like, I'm not going to be a king because there's not supposed to be kings. His response is, no, God uh, is who delivered you. God is supposed to be your king. So maybe you would say a king can work as long as God is recognized as the ultimate authority and the ultimate deliverer. That wasn't the situation playing out in Gideon's time. Gideon was being seen as the deliverer. He was being seen as the, uh, you know, the top dog. And so Gideon says, no, no, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Remember, too, in chapter 9 in the parable uh, that Jotham tells, Remember, Jotham is not saying that there should be no kings. Jotham's parable about the trees asking for the bramble to rule over them is, look what kind of king you're bringing upon yourself. That's not going to turn out good. So maybe if we did have a better king, things could go well. Uh, but in this case, kingship is uh, introduced in a distorted way, and it doesn't go well for uh, the people of Israel. Okay, I want to tie all this in then to the goals for our class. Think about what the Gideon story says about the cycle of sin uh, that we see. I meant to, meant to say this, but, but maybe one thing we learn as parents and as people thinking about the future of our families and the future of our, of our churches, maybe we would talk about the difference between our words and our actions. Think about Gideon saying, oh no, I, saying all the right things, the pious things. I'm not going to be king, and then his life shows something very different. I wonder if that uh, is a temptation for us, that we can do that. Again, especially with our children. We tell them, oh, no, you know, God's most important, and always trust God. And, you know, the, but what does our life show? What is our life, you know, what's most important in our life? Where, where, you know, the old, old thing about, you know, look at your checkbook. Not that anyone ever uses checkbooks anymore, but where's the money going? Where's the time going? What's really most important, uh, regardless of what we're telling our kids or telling other people? Um, and then, you know, you can kind of turn that around to, to say, okay, we need to change our habits, change our ways in order to build upward, to cultivate trust in God as opposed to allowing things to deteriorate. And then the, the example of Gideon, uh, who maybe started with promise and then failed as a leader. The example of Abimelech, a worldly person who's in it for the power and ends up, everybody involved gets hurt. Realize that, that, that the king that we have is, is not that way at all, that we have such a uh, wonderful. We have God himself, the person of Jesus Christ, our king, perfect in every way, humble, meek, lowly, not in it for the power, uh, but deserving of all power and glory and authority. And uh, he will uh, always do uh, good for us and take care of us, and we can submit and serve him faithfully and confidently. Um, so uh, the Gideon story, I think, helps us with those goals. And remember that we're also trying to learn some things about uh, there's some details, some facts about the book of Judges. So let's see how we do with, uh, with some of these things. Okay, first judge. Othniel. We're doing major judges, just to clear that up. So maybe whoever said that wants to revoke it if you're in the camp of Othniel's not a major judge. But we're saying Othniel's a major judge. Uh, he gets more than one verse, so that's good enough for me. And uh, who's the enemy that Othniel takes on? Mesopotamia. Anybody remember the king's name? I have to look for it. Yeah, that's right. I should just put that in parentheses. Can't pronounce. Okay. Actually, I think that's the translation for Kushan or Shethayim. It literally means can't pronounce. Uh, Kushan or Shethayim, king of Mesopotamia, is the enemy that uh, Othniel defeats. What do you want to remember? What's a unique detail about Othniel's story? Yeah. Exactly. I, I, his nephew, son, I should change those back and forth. My, Michael's right. He is first the nephew, then the son-in-law, because he takes up the challenge to go fight the enemy. Um, and so there's the connection to Caleb there and the tribe of Judah. Second judge, Ehud. And, and uh, who's the enemy of Ehud? Moab and King Eglon. Ehud, Eglon go together. And the unique detail? The dagger in the stomach, the left hand, the secretness, the, uh, you know, cool upper chamber, you know, we know what that's about. And, uh, yeah, there are lots of fun things to remember about the Ehud story. Uh, third major judge here. Yeah, Deborah, and also with Deborah we want to remember in parentheses. Yeah, Barak. And who's their enemy? Yeah, Jabin, the king of the Canaanites with the commander. Sit, sit. All these pronunciations, I feel like, you know, you're shaming me, I, you know, Sisera, you know. 
Uh, I'm just giving you a hard time, Michael. Sisera, that's what I always said. So, and the unique detail about the Deborah story? Yeah, it's, uh, we have uh, the woman gets the glory, jail hammering the tent peg into Sisera. Uh, remember the rain that bogs down the chariots of iron in the valley? Uh, lots of cool things. The flooding of the Kishon, uh, it's a cool story. Um, and then the fourth major judge... Yeah, Gideon and, and Abimelech. My dad always had us whisper Abimelech when we would do the name the judges. He'd always just whisper Abimelech. So get him in there, but he's not really a judge. Um, who's the enemy of Gideon? Yeah, the Midianites. And what, what's the unique detail about Gideon? What did I have? here? Yeah, the 300 is great. Uh, I think they made a movie about that. Oh, wait, that was a different 300. Um, or you could remember... You could, so, how positive, negative you want to be about Gideon. You can remember the good, you can remember the bad, the signs, the fleece, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's up to you. Um, okay, the cycle of sin. So this is just the detail. This is who ruled. Uh, but this is a one after another, you know, uh, everything is like what came before it, nothing new. There's a cycle here. What's the cycle? I, if I click the button, it's going to show you the whole thing. So I've got to ask you now. What's the cycle? Four parts. Sin is the first part of the cycle. It's the first thing that happens, and sin leads to oppression, um, or what was the S word? Um, servitude, yeah. Uh, servitude of the people, oppression, plundering leads to, yeah, supplication, crying out for help, for God's help, and then that leads to salvation, um, which also usually has a kind of a period of peace. By the way, notice at some point, it says it never says that anymore that there was peace in the land uh, it's another part of this kind of downward spiral but typically speaking uh, after the salvation there is a period of peace before the people then uh, go back to their ways of rebellion okay but over the course of judges the case that we're making is that there's really a spiral downward you, th you look at this three-dimensionally technically this is two two still two-dimensional but you know what i mean uh, you expand it out a little bit and it's not just one flat spiral we are moving downward and uh, I think in the story of Jephthah, that'll become even more obvious. If you're still holding out, you're still doubting me that Gideon is somehow worse than Barak or, you know, worse than Othniel or whatever, uh, just wait, okay? I, I think Jephthah and then Samson makes the case pretty clear. Um, so let's talk about, uh, not yet Jephthah, but there are two judges we want to mention in, uh, in Judges 10, 1 to 5. And I'll just go ahead and give this to you. Um, Notice the way that Tola and Jair are described. Again, nothing said about them. We're not putting these in the major judge category. Uh, but do notice the way they are described in Judges 10. It says, After Abimelech died, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, that's tough to have that name, but uh, a man of Issachar arose to save Israel. He lived in Shamir, in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried in Shamir. After him, Jer the Gileadite arose and judged Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities in the land of Gilead that are called Havoth Jer to this day. And Jer died and was buried in Kamon. Um, in, in terms of our negative picture of the judges, Jer, I think, really is more remarkable than, uh, than Tola because we know about Jer and his, you know, he's got the, all the sons. The sons have wives. They have cities given to them. I mean, that description sounds like what? What you say? Yeah, it's prosperity. What's the word I have up here? You can't. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of that like Gideon picture of, uh, you know, acting like a king. You give your son cities. You know, if, for what the judges are, that looks more like a king than, than a judge. Okay. Tola, uh, depending on how much you want to make of it, by the way, just notice that it says he arose to save Israel, and it says that he, uh, he arose, and then, and then the, uh, literally the word for he lived in Shamir is he sat in Shamir. That sounds more like what Deborah did, right? That Deborah not only brought about the deliverance of Israel, but she was a stabilizing force. She sat to judge Israel. You wonder, coming off of Abimelech, it doesn't say who the enemy is. Maybe what Tola did was kind of just provide some you know, stability after Abimelech caused all of his internal problems. Uh, but, again, uh, more than, uh, than what's in the text about Tola or Jer, really, is speculation. So, just know that Tola and Jer come next. So, in terms of minor judges, Shamgar, Tola, Jer, so far, and they fit in between the, the major judges. 
uh, up to this point. Okay, let's get to Jephthah here. And uh, you see your map of Israel's judges, and uh, uh, Jephthah is going to be over here on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, and we call this area Gilead, which borders on Ammon and Moab uh, down here to the south. Um, we'll come back to a map if it's helpful. And uh, let's just jump into reading. Judges 10, 6 to 16. We'll read it. Think about these questions. There is a microphone in the back. I see John is very eager to you know, put his gloves and microphone to use. Um, so remember, if you just have a quick thing to say, like it has been so far, just shout it out. But if you, if you have a comment to make, raise your hand, wait for John to come to you and, uh, and to speak so that everybody at home and here can hear you. But let's read 10 to 16 and think about Israel's apostasy and the response, the back and forth between God and Israel uh, in their rebellion. Judges 10, 6. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord served the Baals and the Asheroth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. They afflicted and crushed the sons of Ammon. Uh, sorry, they afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year. For 18 years they afflicted all the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in Gilead in the land of the Amorites. The sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. Verse 10, Then the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. The Lord said to the sons of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the sons of Ammon, the, and the Philistines? And when the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Mayanites oppressed you, you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hands. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. The sons of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Okay, uh, what do you want to say? I, I, maybe my, my question will just be, is there anything different here? Anything different than what we've seen before uh, in the apostasy and God's response and Israel's response and any of that? Do we see some changes? Brian, you have something? Uh, I, I think it's a because the elders who came, I don't see where God raised up Jephthah to save the Israelites, but that it's the elders that came to him pleading because apparently he's a valiant warrior with things around rough company and can deal with uh, problems, and so they ask him to be their leader and uh, their judge. And we'll get to that. That's in the, in the next section. And, uh, uh, but maybe there's something connected here to what we've read. What, what is God's response uh, to, to the people? Because I, I think it, 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 it ties into what, what Brian has uh, uh, previewed for us. Yeah, uh, this, this, this is God's response. You've chosen these false gods? Go ask them for help. Okay. Um, what, what, what else? What, what comes to your mind in terms of what's different here about uh, either Israel's sin or God's response or Israel's response? What's different here than, than things that we've seen even earlier in the book? Yeah, in fact, there are, uh, won't surprise you, seven false gods listed in chapter 10, verse 6. And Terry's right, that, th that's, a, that's a longer list than what has come before. By the way, just for fun, God seems to respond with a sevenfold uh, reminder when he goes through and says, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, the Philistines? All, there's seven of those that he names to say, you know, for all the gods I've delivered you from, you went and chose uh, a god to serve. Okay, so it does seem to be worse, okay? Um, and uh, as uh, Granny points out, this is the harshest reply yet. Jehovah says, not only what she mentioned, go turn to your gods, but what does God explicitly say about them, or uh, about their situation, what he's going to do? I will save you no more. Okay. So what happens here? Now, Brian interestingly points out that we're going to see that, that it does not say God raises up Jephthah, although it, it does mention God's involvement. But 
uh, doesn't have that same kind of formula of, you know, God's, you know, bringing this guy into, uh, into the position of deliverer. Um, but how do we get from this, I will save you no longer. We know, you know, this is like in the TV show. Uh, I won't embarrass my wife too much, but, you know, we watch, a, a, it's like season three of seven, and the main character's like back in the corner. She's like, is he going to live? And I'm like, no, I think he dies here, you know, and the whole rest of the show goes on without the main character, you know. We know that this is going to turn out that there's still more episodes in this, uh, in this series here. So how do we get from I will deliver you no longer to, okay, something happens. So they repent. Uh, it says that they put away the false gods. That's on their end. What about on God's end? What do we make of that? What does that mean that he could... He could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Any uh, interpretations? Okay, again, we've got we to put John to work. He's God loves his children, and uh, they had uh, betrayed him. He says, I'm not going to help you, but yet they repented, and he watched their misery, and his love for them was just too much to bear their difficulties, and, I, and we can see an application in our own lives, you know, Acts uh, 3.19, you know, repent therefore and return so that your sins can be wiped away. They repented, and that had touched God's heart, and he saved them. Thank you. Other thoughts on, uh, on what this means here? Interesting statement. He could bear it no longer, bear the misery of Israel no longer. Daniel? Uh, the ESV translation just says that uh, he became impatient over the misery of Israel, which to me is a little bit less clear than what you have up there, but it, the impatience of that, okay, I'm done um, with their oppression. I'm ready to move on back into the relationship. That, so he is impatient in the fact that he is ready to begin this relationship again. Thank you. Other thoughts? I'm happy to discuss this further of the other, other things uh, we want to say about it because, as has been pointed out, there's maybe some vagueness or some difficulty in understanding this, uh, this phrase here. So I'll just say I don't know. Uh, and uh, so Daniel mentions the ESV translation uh, mentioning the impatience of God towards the misery. That is more confusing but that's more uh, representative, accurate to what the, the, the text says. The, the, the word that's used here does highlight the impatience of God. So what is God impatient with? Is God impatient with... Oh, John Albert? So wait, the question, I'll just finish my question and then let John Albert uh, answer it. So is God impatient with the people and their kind of like sin, repentance, uh, sin, repentance, or is he impatient with, uh, you know, just, he can't, you know, doesn't want to see them any longer suffering and wants to change that. John Albert, what do you think? No, it just reminded me of uh, Ezekiel 36 in verse 22, uh, where God, talking to the Israelites, telling them that thus says the Lord, God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, midst, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. And it, I wonder if there's also that connection to it, that these were, they had a reputation, the Israelites were the people of God, and yet here they were doing all that they were, and to an extent it's kind of like, the again, the father image that I know my dad, whenever I'd leave the house, would always remind me that like I'm taking his name out into the world, and so the actions that I partake in, they come back upon him, that it could also be that factor in it, that the, uh, everything that they were doing and all the misery which they had was having an effect that other people were looking at the Israelites and saying, oh, this is God's people, and look how hmm. pitiful, how terrible they are right now. All right, thank you. Uh, Jordan and then and Brian. John, how did you get stuck with this by yourself? I wonder um, if there's, in verse 16, if there's some sort of time element that maybe we don't pick up on. So, as you mentioned, this is a different response the Lord has on this uh, than we've seen in the past. So, they say, 
hey, they call out to the Lord, we're suffering, we want deliverance. God says, go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Then it says, they put away the foreign gods among them, they serve the Lord. So I wonder if, you know what I mean? So they put away the gods, they serve the Lord. Is there some period of time that happened there? And then God looks upon it and says, I am now impatient over the misery that they find themselves in. Just a hypothetical. Brian? Yeah, I kind of looked up a passage here, Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 11, talking about that God chose Israelites not because they were um, many, um, but because they were the fewest. And he goes on to say that because the Lord loves you and has kept his oath to the forefathers, that oath is ultimately to us, and that God is faithful to keep his covenant and to keep his loving kindness. So you see the power of the covenant, the first being the law of Moses, of course, which was the prophetic figure of the new covenant of which God takes care of us. So he's faithful towards us and he's faithful to his children who are under his covenant. And as we repent, he is faithful to forgive us as we see here, even though they really vexed God quite a bit. Vexed, that's such a, that's such a good word. And uh, yes, there you go. That, that's a lot, of, a lot of things to think about there. And I, I would say there's elements of all of this going on. I mean, you can't read Judges without being astounded at the faithful mercies of God uh, time and time again. And that does give us comfort for today and for ourselves. But at the same time, uh, if, if we even have one small inclination that somehow the Israelites lay us a pattern of how to live ourselves and just thinking, oh, well, you know, I'll just do my thing. And then, you know, when, when it gets hard, I'll ask God to forgive me. And then, you know, I'll repent and come back to him. Uh, that that's the sure sure path to destruction as well. And so I think we are s- supposed to also see God becoming exasperated, am I saying that right? Uh, to some degree with what's going vexed with their situation and seeing his name profaned in this way, uh, seeing his people suffering, being so uh, uh, bothered deeply by their, their failure over and over and over again. Um, all of this, I think, is in play. And of course, in the end, we don't know the mind of God and know, don't know exactly. But I will say it's a little bit less straightforward than, for instance, like in Jonah, where it says, they repented and God relented and, and, and you know, saved them. This is a little bit more murky than that, that there's more of an, an exasperation, frustration, uh, impatience of God uh, as he sees the, the, the situation of his people. Okay. Let's, that, that's, that gets good. Lays the groundwork then, uh, both in terms of the distress that uh, they're facing, as well as the, the murkiness of their, of their covenant situation here. All of that lays a good background for what we read of uh, Jephthah, his rise to, uh, to being a judge, uh, starting in chapter 10, verse 17, down to chapter 11, verse 11. Then the sons of Ammon were summoned and they camped in Gilead. And the sons of Israel gathered together and camped in Mizpah. The people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the sons of Ammon? He shall become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in your father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah, and they went out with him. Verse 4, It came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief, that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Okay, 
uh, what do you want to say about how it is that, uh, that Jephthah becomes the leader and the chief um, of the people of Mizpah here? How does it happen? Brian has uh, p- already pointed out for us a very good observation, which is that it is the, uh, the, it's the people, actually I think that's my first note here, it's the leaders that say uh, to each other, <laughs> who's going to lead us, okay? Which you can see maybe, is, as Brian points out, a little bit backwards in terms of how things were supposed to go and inquiring of the Lord or God raising up somebody. Uh, so there's that element. Um, but what else? What, what do you make of uh, Jephthah and his characterization at this early point in the story as we're introduced to him and see his rise to power? Albert? Well, in the ver- end of ver- chapter 10, the elders are making a plan and they're asking who, who shall go and fight. And then we get in the beginning of chapter 11, he was a valiant warrior. So, I mean, the elders aren't in error or falling away from disobeying God. I mean, they're coming in like, okay, hey, we need to pull ourselves together and we're going to rally together, we're going to fight, we need to find somebody to fight. And then we get the introduction of Jephthah, that he was a valiant warrior, and then we get the details of it, so, you know, the elders had done wrong against him, but then I, I just wonder if they're like, you know what, he was, or it appears he was the, the best of the fighters that would lead a battle. So. There's a practicality, perhaps, uh, to them. Um, and what do you make of Jephthah, his response and his uh, conversation with these once Rejectors now, uh, supplicators. Political opportunity. Opportunity for what, Jordan? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and and what did you say? Oh yeah, sure. Um, oh, Lee. Yeah. Well, I think his response is not that different than God's response to <laughs> the people of Israel. I mean, he says. Go back to the people that, you know, dance with the one that brung you. Um, as far as, I mean, God said, you know, you went to these bales, go seek their help. Jeff says, you, you turned me away, so what's the, what's the point? Why are, you, why, are you, why are you coming to me now? Notice in each of these episodes of the Jephthah story, there is this, uh, this theme of the conversation back and forth. That, s- ter- that start to mirror each other. And Lee points out the first of those connections, which is that this dialogue between Israel and God in the first episode now has a, a mirror, an echo, in the conversation between the, the people of Mizpah and Jephthah. Okay? You know, they're in trouble. We need someone to save us. God said, you're turning to me? What about the other gods? Jephthah says, you're turning to me? I thought you hated me. Okay, so there is a similarity there. Michael? Jephthah also, in the dialogue, he he says, you know, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord the Lord gives them into to my hand, like I, I kind of sense that he is at least more mindful of needing God to win the battle rather than just a powerful warrior. I mean, I mean, it's smart to go after a powerful warrior if you're going to go into battle. I, I mean, that makes good logical sense, but maybe this is a perhaps a, a time when Israel was like not turning to God, you know, or, or relying on him and just looking for a, a practical, only a practical solution rather than, you know, trusting ultimately in, in God for the, their, their s- to be saved. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've said that about Gideon, about, about Barak, and again, uh, it's actually H.E., he's not here, but I can point at his family. Uh, H.E. Uh, taught on Jephthah a- and Samson, I believe, both, uh, in the Hebrews 11 class. You go back and li- listen to that. Um, and to, to think through why it is the case that, that uh, someone like Jephthah, as well as others, uh, wind up in Hebrews 11. Um, but I do want to, and kind of, you know, that, that would be tangentially re- related to this, uh, that uh, not because I like stirring up a disagreement, although I do. Uh, you know, what Michael has said and what Jordan has said are a little bit at odds with each other. So uh, Michael says, oh, Jephthah's saying, hey, you know, God's, if, if God gives us the victory, he's trusting in God, he recognizes God's going to give him. 
Jordan says, Jephthah's just, he's an opportunist. He's, see, he's seeing a chance here to uh, come back from being the rogue. He's like a pirate or something, you know, out there in the, in the uh, outskirts of, uh, of Gilead with his worthless fellows. You know, I don't know if they're killing and raiding and plundering, whatever they're doing. Uh, speculation, obviously. But now, th- you know, this is opportunity. Oh, yeah, you weren't so friendly to me before. Well, how about, you know, when I come back? And he makes a deal with them, you know. Uh, you, want to, you want to deliver? Well, how about making me head? How about making me chief over you if I agree and, and, and God gives us this, this victory? So, again, uh, I think both those things can be true at the same time. I, when I said remind of anything, I don't know if you were thinking of Abimelech, but there may be something to that here that, uh, like in the story of Abimelech, and the asking for the bramble to rule over us, is kind of like, we need somebody strong. Is Jephthah like the most upright guy around? Probably not, but, but hey, he's a strong man. Let's go to him for uh, protection. Um, and then uh, we point out this, uh, this trait of Jephthah. It says, in uh, chapter 11, notice a phrase that we'll see more of, uh, all the words that he spoke in verse 11. Jephthah's words are a big part of the story, and he is skilled with his words and negotiating with the people of Mizpah uh, to become not only their, their military leader, but also their, their head as well. Okay. Anything else we want to say about, uh, about this section, the selection of Jephthah by the elders here? Cool. Let's move on then, and this will probably work out well. We, it's a longer reading, but, but I think uh, we can move through it and then set us up for uh, the kind of climax of the story on Wednesday. Um, although if you're going to be gone Wednesday, you probably would rather talk about the sacrifice of, of Jephthah's daughter today, because it's interesting to talk about. Um, but let's get in. I, I was going to show you where these things are taking place. Here's the Dead Sea. The Jordan River, remember Gilead is this area east of the Jordan, it's kind of, you know, indistinctly defined, and Ammon is on the other side of, uh, of this area of Gilead that was given to the Israelites, the tribe of Gad in particular, um, and this was like where Jephthah had been exiled to, and they're going to go from uh, Mizpah, where is that, right here, to get Jephthah and come back to this conflict with the Ammonites. Okay, chapter 11, 12 to 28, and there's now another dialogue, this time between uh, Jephthah, representing the Israelites, and uh, the Ammonite leaders in this dispute and during this conflict. So think about the conflict here and uh, what Jephthah says in this dialogue. Judges 11, verse 12. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, What is between you and me? that you have come to me to fight against my land. The king of the sons of Ammon said to the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up from Egypt, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok and the Jordan, therefore return them peaceably now. But Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the sons of Ammon. And they said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the sons of of Ammon, excuse me, verse 16, for when they came up from Egypt, and Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, please let us pass through your land, but the king of Edom would not listen, and they also sent to the king of Moab, he would not consent, so Israel remained at Kadesh, then they went through the wilderness, and around the land of Edom, and the land of Moab, and came to the east side of the land of Moab, And they camped beyond the Arnon, but they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land uh, to our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, so Sihon gathered all his people and camped in Jahaz and fought with Israel. The Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel. They defeated them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. So they possessed all the territory of the Amorites, the land uh, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok, from the wilderness as far as the Jordan. Since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you then to possess it? Do you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord has, uh, for whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we will possess it. Now are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive with Israel, or did he ever fight against them? 
While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, and the Aurora and its villages, and all the cities in the banks of the Arnon, 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the, the judge, judge today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. Okay, um, what's the nature of the conflict between the, uh, the Ammonites and the Israelites here? Brian? Well, if you go back to the book of Numbers, as the Israelites were proceeding towards the promised land, there were three nations of their brothers. There was Edom, which was the descendants of uh, Esau. There was Ammon, and there was Moab, the descendants of Lot, being the nephew of Abraham, the father of the Israelites. And all three nations denied safe passage to the promised land. So they went around, and then they, when they approached the Amorites, they wouldn't give them safe passage either. And uh, Joshua and the Israelites went in there and cleaned their plate and possessed their land, which was never the possessions of Moab or Ammon. And now, inexplicably, Ammon says, this is our land that you took from the Amorites. And um, Japheth uh, uh, states his position, clearly you are wrong and you will not have it. And thus, there was war. And it doesn't help that Ammonites and Amorites are so similar, you know, uh, because he keeps referring to the land of the Amorites. Okay, and uh, but Brian's right, those are different people. So I'll just show you this real quick. Um, this is a, a map of the conquest of Canaan. So back uh, in the history, the Numbers 21, is uh, Brian mentioned, is one place. So they come up, uh, you know, out of the wilderness. And uh, yeah, so here's Edom, here's Moab, and here's Ammon. Okay? Uh, and as Brian mentioned, those three have connections to uh, Israel's past, and so they were protected by God. So the Israelites go around Edom, they go around Moab, and then really they just need to come right here. Who's doing that? Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, so they come up here, and uh, the, all they need to do is just go over the Jordan, right, into Jericho. And as Brian mentioned, this is the land of the Amorites. So the land of the Amorites is here, bordering the land of the Ammonites. And so they come here, Sihon and Og, you know, they get beat right here, and then uh, they can go into Jordan. And uh, Ammon's hanging out over here. Now, a larger map would be more clear, uh, but this is, uh, th this is what explains a lot of this conflict. What's over here? What's, uh, what's Ammon's other border? Yeah, like, wilt, like just desert. It's just miles and miles of, of uninhabitable wasteland until you get to Mesopotamia, okay? So, I mean, come on. Everybody, right, wants to expand their territory. Every nation in history seeks to expand their territory. Ammon, they want to expand. Where can they go? Well, there's really only one direction, okay? Uh, and that is the land over here. And so there is perpetual uh, conflict really throughout the Old Testament. In the book of Amos, Ammon gets uh, judged for their, um, their harshness and their affliction uh, of Gilead on this side of the Jordan. Um, and that's where the conflict goes. And Jephthah retells the history. By the way, anybody surprised that Jephthah knew all that? Yeah, exactly. and I'm, I'm kind of curious about that, because we made the point before that, that there seems to be some history lacking uh, in Judges. They don't remember certain things about their past. So I don't know, maybe, maybe because Jephthah is a Gileadite, that's like, hey, I mean, you, you, well, you here that are Texans, you know, you may have no idea what happened in any other 49 states, but you know your Texas history, you know, uh, you know about the Alamo and uh, whatever that guy's name was, San Juan or whatever, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not from here, so I don't know, okay? But I know about Oglethorpe. Okay, and I know about, uh, you know, Andersonville, prisoner of war camp, and all that kind of stuff that you guys don't know about, because you know about the history of where you're from, okay? Uh, and so maybe Jephthah, a Gileadite, knew the history of Gilead, and he was able to recount this. And notice, even again, just practically speaking, notice in, uh, in verse uh, 26, he says, Israel lived in Heshbon, its villages, and the Aurora, and its village, and all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon. 300 years. Why did you not recover them within that time? Jephthah's saying, all this time's gone by. You've never made a complaint. You've never attacked before. Uh, so this is good. This, uh, we're done? Okay. All right, we'll pick up there uh, and maybe recap Jephthah's words and then get into the climax of the story involving his daughter. Uh, and that will be on Wednesday. Same handout. And if you're not here, tune into the live stream. Thank you, guys. <laughs>